Thinking is a skill. And just like any other, it can be improved with practice. And let's just say most of us have plenty of room for improvement. Let's try a few practice problems. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 total. And the bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? She got it right. I don't know about the rest of you. The most common answer is 10 cents. But if the ball costs 10 cents, then the bat costs $1.10. So it has to be a nickel. Let's try the next one. If it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long does it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? 100 is the tempting answer to complete the pattern, but each machine makes a widget every five minutes, so 100 machines makes 100 widgets in five minutes. All right, last try. A patch of lily pads is on a lake, and it doubles in size every day. If it takes 48 days to cover the whole lake, how long does it take to cover half the lake? 47! Well done. A lot of people divide 48 by 2 and say 24, but it's doubling every day. All right. So this set of three problems is called the cognitive reflection test. Um, the other CRT that you don't hear about in school board meetings and campaign rallies. When researchers gave this set of three questions to students at Harvard, they got less than 50% correct. And it's not because the math involved is that difficult. It's because each of these problems was designed to have an easily available wrong answer. Right? A moment's check will tell you it's wrong, but we tend to not take that moment. Right? It's, it's not that carefully thinking through the problems is that hard. The challenge is in realizing you need to be careful at all. Now, you all had the unfair advantage of assuming I'm up to no good. You were probably better prepared for sneaky tricks than you would be in your everyday life, so don't get cocky. <laughs> the researcher Dan Cahan gave this CRT test to almost 2,000 American adults, and then he asked them how good a job they thought it did of measuring reflective and open-minded thinking. But before he did that, he gave them one extra piece of information. Half of the participants were told that climate change skeptics tended to do worse on the test, and the other half were told that climate change believers tended to do worse. You can probably predict the results. Let's first look at the people who did worst on this test, people who got zero of the three questions right. You can see that when liberals were told that climate change believers did worse, they didn't think it was a very good test, right? But when they were told that climate change skeptics did worse, they were more encouraged, right? And the opposite pattern for conservatives. This is called confirmation bias. In order to confirm their pre-existing belief that it's their side that does all the open-minded thinking, thank you very much, people will reject any information to the contrary, but will readily accept confirmatory information. Now, I noticed a lot of you did pretty well on those first three problems, so you might be thinking that your superior intellectual abilities would prevent you from making such an illogical error. You're wrong. <laughs> the people who did best on the test, who got two or even all three questions right, showed three times as much confirmation bias. It seems like the smarter you are, the better you are at convincing yourself you were right all along. Let's see another example. Van Boven and colleagues did an experiment where they asked people to choose between two pieces of probabilistic information and report which one was more useful for deciding whether to support a ban on immigration from majority Muslim countries. Participants were told that the probability that an immigrant from a Muslim country is a terrorist is 0.00004%, but that the probability that a terrorist immigrant was from a Muslim country was 72%. If you tell me which of these two pieces of information seems more important, I'll be able to predict your political affiliation fairly well with Democrats overwhelmingly picking the one that says a given Muslim immigrant is highly unlikely to be a terrorist, 
while conservatives think it's more important to point out that terrorists are highly likely to be Muslim. But what I love about this experiment is they had a second condition too, where they asked the same people a very similar type question about an assault weapons ban. This time, people completely switched which type of information they thought was more important in order to support their pre-existing beliefs. And now we've got Democrats telling us that it's more important to focus on how amongst the people who did a bad thing, most of them came from a specific group, while the conservatives now think it's more important to say, but the people in that group are highly unlikely to do the bad thing. And just like we saw with the cognitive reflection test, the people who were more intelligent, more well-educated, who better understood probabilities, were the ones that were most likely to switch which type of information they preferred in order to agree with whatever their pre-existing opinion on the subject was. Now, I'm not trying to equivocate between these two situations. Not letting someone own an assault weapon is importantly different from not letting their family immigrate to this country. But our, reason, our failure to reason objectively is interesting. In both of these situations, we're pretty much trying to sort people into two categories, right? People who are allowed to do something and people who aren't allowed to do something. And in these situations, I find signal detection theory to be a really useful framework to talk about what's going on. This was originally designed to characterize the performance of radar operators, but we're going to use these two examples of a travel ban or a red flag law instead. In both situations, we're trying to distinguish between normal people and potential terrorists and criminals, and in order to do so, we'll have some sort of background check. We can see that the terrorists and criminals tend to look more suspicious than the normal people. Good. But it's not as clean as we would like. There's a lot of overlap there. And in order to decide if a given person gets to own a weapon or bring their family to this country, we have to pick some sort of threshold, right? Uh, a criterion of suspiciousness, below which you're allowed to do what you want, but above which we're not going to let you. When we do that, we end up making two different kinds of errors. One is called a miss, and these are the potentially dangerous people who, by virtue of looking less suspicious than they should, are allowed to immigrate or own a weapon even though they probably shouldn't be. The other type of error is called a false alarm, which is normal upstanding citizens who aren't allowed to exercise their rights or opportunity because they happen to score abnormally high on this test. Now we can trade off between these two different types of errors by moving where our criterion is. If we've got a really strict criterion, not a lot of people are going to own guns or immigrate, and that has the positive effect of reducing the number of misses, right? these dangerous people who slip through the cracks but it has the negative consequence of greatly inflating our percentage of false alarms, and there's a lot of people who won't be allowed to do what maybe they should be allowed to do. So this would be like the hyper-paranoid nanny state that doesn't trust its citizens. The opposite example is the libertarian dream, where everybody owns guns and immigrates. In this situation, we have very few false alarms, which is great, but we have a corresponding explosion in the number of misses, which is not great. What I like about this framework is it does a good job of showing how someone can disagree with your opinion on what the perfect level of immigration or gun ownership should be without being evil or stupid, right? Democrats tend to prefer a more lax criterion on immigration and a strict criterion on gun ownership, and conservatives the opposite. But when anyone talks about it, all they ever focus on is the one type of error that they're most focused on minimizing. And we need to be honest that both things are bad, and there's no one right answer for how much worse one is than the other. So what I want you to remember that googly eyes are hilarious. <laughs> and that our brains didn't just evolve in order to seek the truth. There were strong pressures of expediency and signaling group membership. And honest disagreements can occur through differing access to information or different priorities. And although it's easy to see bias in other people, we need to remember that we're humans too. 
And we can be easily misled by manipulative framings or our own motivated reasoning. And I've shown you today how intelligence isn't always an adequate defense. And sometimes it even makes things worse. So you need to stay vigilant and try and nurture a sense of compassion for those who might have arrived at a different conclusion than you. There's a lot of great books written about this subject if you want to learn more information. So go ahead and good luck out there.